All right, we're going to do a study today on the premillennial coming and reign of Jesus Christ. Okay, now let me define that for you. If you're newly saved, you might not understand what's going to happen. Well, right now from today, all right, going into the future according to what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that there is going to be a catching away of the bride of Christ. Okay, the church age is what we are currently in, where salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. And uh, anybody can get saved. God's no respecter of persons. Um, that's what we are in right now. Now, at, at a point in time, the church, the body of Christ, is going to be taken off of this earth. Okay, that's called, we, many call it the, the rapture. Uh, the Bible teaches that it will happen before the coming time of Jacob's trouble. Many people call it the, the Great Tribulation. Um, and then at that point, God's done with dealing with the church. Anybody can get saved and things. To now God turns his attention. You look at the Old Testament. He's dealing solely with the nation of Israel. Then the church comes in. So you have Jews and Gentiles being saved. God doesn't respect, say, well, I'm only going to save Jews now or something or deal with only the Jews. Nope, right now anybody can get saved. And, uh, but that time ends, and then God says, okay, and he turns his attention back to the Jews again. And because they've rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah for nearly 2,000 years, God's judgment comes upon that nation. And, uh, and for seven years, he's quite harsh with the Jewish people. And there are some Gentiles, of course, that do get saved in that time period, but things change a little bit. Okay, And again, this is... I'm not going to get into all this in this study, but what we're going to focus on is what happens after this time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year period. Jesus Christ comes back down, the second coming, and then he rules and reigns on the earth, physically on the earth, uh, as the Messiah to the Jews, and uh, he fulfills those promises that he made. See, that's where Jews get messed up because they think that he had to fulfill the, the Messiah, you know, will fulfill everything the first time including his millennial reign. Uh, no, uh, he was rejected by the nation of Israel. So his millennial reign was put off for a little bit of time. But when he comes back at the second coming, he's going to rule and reign uh, from Jerusalem. Okay, So that's what the King James Bible teaches. And I'm going to show you that today. And uh, you can turn in your Bible to Psalm 2, back in the Old Testament. So the teaching there, and to kind of finish up what I was saying... Um, the millennial kingdom is basically going to be Jesus Christ physically on the throne over in Jerusalem and the Christians, those that have been saved and they get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble go through the judgment seat of Christ and then the marriage supper of the Lamb come back down, we, we, well the marriage of the Lamb and then the marriage supper is down on the earth and then we rule and reign with Christ for 1,000 years and we're going to talk about this as we go through this study so, premillennial coming of Jesus Christ and reign of Jesus Christ is Jesus comes at the beginning of the millennium and he is there the whole way through it with his saints ruling and reigning. So, if you're a Christian today and if you've never heard of this before, um, understand that it's not just you go to heaven when you die. Okay, that's there. But the beautiful thing is there's going to come a point in time when you're going to hear your name called and you're going to go up. That's the rapture. And you're going to be there, spared from the events that are going on in the book of Revelation. And then you get to come back down and live here in an incorruptible body, a body that's not going to get sick, that's not going to feel pain. And you're going to be here for 1,000 years. So if you've had some kind of frustrated ambitions, things that you've wanted to do, and places you've wanted to go, and whatever else, and you're just like, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to see whatever. Uh, well, you're going to be coming back here to this earth, and it's going to be restored and no more wickedness and the evil and things in that premillennial, pre you know, kingdom of Jesus Christ. The millennial kingdom, I'll say it that way. You're going to be back here for 1,000 years, ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. If you suffer as a Christian. Okay, we're going to get into that too. But there's a lot of things in Scripture um, that you can get into really deep study and things. And we're going to go over quite a few Scriptures today. It's going to be a detailed study. Uh, this was originally preached back September 5th of 2010. Um, and ironic because that's my son's birthday. And of course I wouldn't have known that in 2010. Wasn't even married back then. But but uh, this is I'm going to be redoing this because it was originally an audio sermon many years ago. But uh, 
you know, there's, I just wanted to, I was thinking about this before I did this study, and I thought, you know, there's a lot of things in Scripture that, yeah, you can get into the deep, you know, verse comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture, but really it's just a matter of common sense. See, there are only two real views about this coming millennium. Okay, there's three, but really only two. Let me explain. Let me go over the three, first of all. First of all, you have amillennial, the amillennial system. That is, ah, before millennial means that there isn't any millennium. Okay, it's just merely symbolic. Um, the amillennial system would say that, uh, well, all the events of Revelation, Matthew 24, all the end times prophecy stuff already took place way back in the first century. It's done. It's over. And the thousand years isn't really a thousand year kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's just symbolic of his church reigning or something like this. You know, And again, there's so many different branches of this. You have the preterist view and you know they debate little fine points back and forth. I don't even waste time with some of this stuff because it's just ridiculous. Um, basically, the Catholics are, are amillennial. Uh, they, they're the ones that are teaching a lot of the amillennial stuff. Um, then you have the Reformed. Uh, school of thought where it's post-millennial. All right, the church gets to a, such a point of wonderful goodness that it brings in a thousand-year kingdom of the church ruling and reigning, and Jesus Christ is in heaven. Jesus Christ isn't physically on the earth. You see, it's the church, and then Jesus Christ comes back at the end of that, you know, post-millennial system. And again, I've debated with these guys back and forth. I don't mean official debate, you know, because I think that's a waste of time. But I've gone back and forth with these people. Oh, we don't believe that. We don't. You're ignorant of the, our position. And and you get through the whole thing, arguing points with them and stuff like this. And you get to the end, you're you know, it's like, yes, I do understand what you believe, and yes, you do say these things. So, but then the third and the right one is the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ and reign of Jesus Christ there where he's there for the whole millennial kingdom. So those are the three different types, amillennial, post-millennial, and premillennial. All right, now there's three, but there's really only two, okay? The two are either the church of Jesus Christ is currently reigning or will reign in the future, or the Bible-believing system is understanding that man is a failure and always will be a failure, saved or lost, okay? And there's no way even saved Christians could bring in a thousand-year kingdom with the church ruling and reigning without Jesus Christ physically on the earth. See, either you believe Jesus Christ has to be here physically to fix things up, or you believe the church does. That's really the only two different types of beliefs. The church brings in peace, or Jesus Christ has to come up and help us out because we're such stupid sinners. I'm in the second camp. Thank you very much. I'm never going to think that I'm so holy that I can be part of some church system that can bring world peace and whatever else and control things for a thousand years. You're out of your mind. Um, most churches don't last, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years. All right. <laughs> Gonna bring it a thousand years, uh huh, sure. But let's uh, let's start out here. Psalm uh, two, verses six through nine. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the de the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Prophecy about the coming Messiah, about Jesus Christ. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. All right. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Jesus is going to get physical rule and reign here on this earth. Why? Because it was promised to him. Pretty significant. Actually having God manifest in the flesh physically here on the earth, ruling and reigning. Looking forward to it. Turn to Psalm 47. Psalm 47, beginning in verse 1. O clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Selah. 
God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. This will be important later, we'll see about this. God reigneth over the heathen, God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto God, he is greatly exalted. Now you look at that thing, and if you are honestly reading that with a clear conscience and just understanding plain English, you're seeing this is people praising him in person. Okay, And he is sitting on a throne, and the heathen are there for his inheritance and the whole deal. He's on the earth. But you see, lost people try to spiritualize things that they don't understand or that they don't like from Scripture. And you will see that thing. And again, if you've seen my study on Let Them Alone, there are some people that you'll, just, you'll meet and they'll just be so bullheaded about this thing, and you just got to say, okay, see ya, goodbye. Jesus Christ is the only one that can restore things on this planet. You know, got to tell you a little story here. I've said this in other sermons, but uh, there was an old man, he was a janitor the one time, and he heard a preacher say that this world sure is a mess, isn't it? And this old man, this old janitor, he said, no, he said, this world's not a mess. The preacher said, what are you talking about? He said, uh, I've been a janitor for 50 years, we'll say, I forget the exact number. And he said, I've cleaned messes up all my life. You can clean messes up. You can't clean this world up. Yeah, that's absolutely true. This world is in a very, very bad state. And to think that man can somehow bring in peace and man can fix things up and whatever else, man has had 6,000 years of history to prove that he has been a consistent failure. Every man. That's why the Bible says every man at his best state is altogether vanity. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Over and over and over again. That's why people hate this book so much. This King James Bible, they hate this book because it's not like other holy books. Other holy books say man is great and man can attain to things and man is the measure of all things. Man is wonderful, man is great and all this stuff. King James Bible says, hey, you, you, yeah, you, you know, you're rotten. You're no good. The very best that you can do is going to land you in hell. God had to send his son down to die on the cross to pay for your rotten, filthy hide. If you're saved, you're saying, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> you come to the end of yourself. But you see, that's why most people don't get saved, because they don't want to come to the end of themselves. They're still hoping. There's some good there. I see good in everybody. <laughs> God doesn't. There's none good. There's none that understandeth. They're all gone out of the way. Scripture after Scripture. I'm quoting Scripture. Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, what God thinks about man. It isn't good. How on earth could man rule down here and bring in peace and everything else? It's not going to happen. Turn next to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It says here, The word that Isaiah the son of Amoz saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow in unto it millennial kingdom. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. Uh, I don't need to go to Jerusalem right now for the Lord to teach me things. He's given me his word. He's given me his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of truth, when he comes, he guides you into all truth. Why do I need to go to Jerusalem? but they will in the millennial kingdom. Let's continue. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. From men? Well, if you're post-millennial or amillennial, that's what you believe. There should be a church that rules things and whatever else. 
And yet you look at the churches that do rule things, you look at the church, you know, state type of countries, they make a miserable mess of things. Verse 4, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. It's funny because the second part there, from the colon on down to the end of the verse in verse 4, that's on the front of the United Nations building, about beating your swords into plowshares and and things like that, spears and the pruning hooks, you know. In other words, they go from fighting to farming. And they have that thing on there. And yet the United Nations, I was going to say usual nuts or, you know, ugly Nazis or whatever you want to make the UN. Um, this is an old statistic, too. I have here written, they sponsored over 157 wars since 1945, since their founding in 1945. The UN sponsors wars and, and all this other stuff, and they're, but they're about peace. We're going to find have peace as soon as we have just one more war. There's a few loose ends we need to tie up. we just got to go kill some more people with our peacekeeping troops, and then we'll have peace. <laughs> sure, sure you will. Uh, I don't think so. Turn next to Isaiah chapter 9. It's really kind of funny. You know, it was a World War One. I, I think, you know, we've had a war to end all wars. <laughs> no, you haven't. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You say, well, that was there in the first century. That, or the, the, not even the first century. We'll say, this is there in the time of Isaiah's day. He's just writing about then as a historical kind of thing. Um, it says, the, uh, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. But there was. Um, they got taken over as a nation. The nation of Israel fell, and they were in captivity when Jesus Christ shows up on the earth. They didn't have their own government and their own laws and whatever else. They're in Roman cap captivity. And finally, the temple was finally destroyed in 70 AD. Um, the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Uh, no, this wasn't fulfilled back in Isaiah's day. This is a future fulfillment that's coming and if you read Revelation chapter 20, um, the devil's bound and cast into the bottomless pit for the thousand-year millennial kingdom, that he's not deceiving the nations anymore. And at the end of the thing, he is unleashed, un unleashed a little bit to go out and deceive the nations one more time because you know they didn't, a lot of the people that are there didn't get to see what things are like right now and in the time of Jacob's trouble specifically. So the Lord's going to show one more time that even after a thousand years of peace and a thousand years of wonderful times, man is still corrupt. The Lord's going to show it. You know, because why? What's the big thing right now? People say, if we just had this, if we just had peace, if we just, you know, had a brother and sister send me this thing this morning, this new ultra, you know, supplement, brain supplement, and Stephen Hawking is saying it's great, and Bill Gates is saying it's great, and Anderson Cooper tried it for 14 days, and it's wonderful, and it gives you all this memory increase, and also the new miracle drug, and it's just going to revolutionize humanity, you know, and all this stuff. No, it's not. It's another money-making scam is all it is. Could even be, you know, putting stuff into people's minds to get them ready for the mark of the beast. I have no idea. But, uh, you know, man has failed over and over and over and over again and the Lord's going to show okay I'm going to give you perfect climate I'm going to give you peace for a thousand years I'm going to give you all these things that man has tried so hard to get and the Lord's going to oversee it all for one thousand years and at the end say okay devil go ahead and the devil's going to come out and he's going to deceive all the nations again and turn most of the people against the Lord and you say well then the end then his government's going to end nope because if you read it the, all these people come and encircle the city of Jerusalem, the, you know, the holy city, and fire comes down from heaven and devours them. So God's, you know, the Lord's government there doesn't end. 
Hmm. So, again, the Lord's going to be on the earth for that. Turn next to the book of Micah. Back towards your New Testament, into the, the books of the Minor Prophets, and you'll find the book of Micah. Yeah, they call them the minor prophets, but I think a lot of times you should call them the dusty prophets because they—that's the kind of the kind of the part of the Bible that just you know gets kind of dusty. Most people don't read the minor prophets. You just kind of go the Old Testament. You end about the Book of Daniel, and then you go to the New Testament. Well, there's some very important things in those minor prophets. Let's uh, see some of those. Micah chapter four, verses one through four. Let's read that. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. Remember what we read in Isaiah? And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Again, very similar to what Isaiah was saying. And he shall judge among many people. He shall judge among many people. See, you could say, well, it just means that you go up to Jerusalem, and when you get to Jerusalem, there's godly men there, and, you know, a good Baptist church, local Baptist church and things. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, and they're the ones, that it's, it's the Lord's authority through them. No, it doesn't say that, though, in verse 3. He shall judge among many people. He's there. The heathen have been given him for an inheritance, and he is instructing in things and judging. And when does that judgment begin? Matthew chapter 25, with the judgment of the nations, when he decides who goes into the kingdom and who gets cast down into the lake of fire. But let's continue. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. It's going to be peaceful. It's going to be a farming, amazing farming time. An agrarian world is what you would call it. Turn next to the book of Zechariah. Keep going towards your New Testament. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Is Jerusalem a city of truth right now? Nope. The vast majority of people living in Jerusalem are living a lie. They're living the lie that the Jesus Christ is not their Messiah. And that's why God's judgment and wrath is coming in the time of Jacob's Trouble, Israel's trouble. You get all these papists out there saying, no, it's not Jacob, it's about the church. Oh, you know. I mean, it's just like, you know, I mean, just, just put a little t-shirt on that says, I'm with stupid and have the arrow pointing at yourself, you know, if you're a post-tribber. I mean, Jesus' death was not enough on the cross, okay? His blood that he shed was not enough on the cross. The church has to be purified by suffering in the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, and it's just like in it, the scripture talks about, you know, you know, the they please not God, they're contrary to all men, therefore the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost, talking about the Jews. And the replacement theology, people say, well, the church is the Jews. It's like, okay, then you're saying that you're a rotten, horrible person. Think about that. I mean, if the time of Jacob's trouble is actually the time of the church's trouble, why is God doing it? When well, you compare Scripture with Scripture, it's because the Jews or the church, you know, wink, wink, uh, is rotten and bad. So by you saying, we're the Jews, we've replaced Israel, and we're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, you're admitting that you're rotten and corrupt and wicked. Hmm. Maybe you ought to get saved. 
okay, then Jesus Christ's righteousness will be imputed to you and you won't be rotten anymore in terms of, you know, judgment coming. They don't think that far. Let's go to the next one. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Who will? I will. The Lord. In other words. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon the church whom they have persecuted. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Read along in your King James Bible, please. It says, And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Does Jesus Christ come back before the Millennial Kingdom? Yes, that's very clear. And of course, some of the uh, you know post-Millennials, I was going to say astute ones, but that's not really accurate because they're not that smart. They say, well, he comes down at the Second Coming, and then he goes back up for the Millennial Kingdom, and then he's up there, and then he comes back down again. <sighs> okay, sure. Uh, no, he's there. He comes back down at the second coming at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble and he's there for the millennial kingdom to rule and reign on the earth. It's crystal clear. I mean, you compare scripture with scripture. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in, is in bitterness for his firstborn. Hmm. How on earth can you get anything but a premillennial coming and you know, millennial reign for Jesus Christ physically on the earth. How can you get anything else out of the King James Bible? You know, and a lot of these new versions like the NIV, a lot of the um, people in that, you know, on the NIV translation committee were Calvinists and stuff like that. And you get a lot of the Calvinists, the Reformed theology people, and they get into the whole post-millennial system. And uh, they'll change their scriptures and stuff to try to kind of lean a little bit more post-millennial. Because they want to rule and reign without Jesus Christ. Again, that's the issue. The Pope says, oh, I'm millennial. Sorry, there is no millennial kingdom. The church is ruling and reigning. And the vicar of Christ is here, Christ's representative. And the, the, those that are conformed to the image of Christ, the Pope, you know, in other words, in Catholicism, are the priests. And the bishops and the archbishops and the cardinals and the whatever other devil-possessed people, the rape children and things like this. I mean, th think of the monstrosity of Roman Catholicism. I mean, really? The Pope is Jesus Christ and all the other Catholic clergy and everything else are those saints that are, you know, conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, you know, ruling and reigning with him on the earth, you know? Yeah, uh, that's pretty disgusting if you ask me. But uh, that's what they believe. And then you get the post-millennial and they say, uh, we just, you know, we're going to get up to a point where we have so much power and things on this earth and influence and, you know, and, and things and wealth, you know, that uh, we're going to be ruling and reigning. They're crazy. Go next to Zechariah 14, verses 8 and 9. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. Hmm. I find that interesting too. Obviously, a, you know, the Lord ruling and reigning on the earth. Now go to verse 16 of the same chapter. Zechariah 14, verse 16 through 21. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. They're going to Jerusalem to worship the King. Why? Because he's physically there. Isn't that obvious? Verse 17. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, 
This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. And that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. All right. Jesus Christ physically there, ruling and reigning. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you can't see it. I you know. Got some issues. Matthew chapter 3. Let's go to the New Testament now and see what the Bible says about this thing. We're going to talk about the kingdom of heaven. The book of Matthew is the only book in your King James Bible that has the term kingdom of heaven. I'm going to show you why that is here. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is that what... Uh, for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Isaiah there said, you know, written Isaiah in your New Testament, because it's coming from Greek to English, Old Testament, Hebrew to English. Um, you know, I have to explain that so people don't think it was CERN or something that changed it. You know, <laughs> People still fall for that thing. It's incredible to me. But, uh, you know, it's been exposed. I mean, we exposed it. It was a witch, Fiona Broom, that came up with the whole Mandela effect thing and stuff like this. It's all a lie. You know, your King James Bible has not changed. Satan and his little minions are not more powerful than the Lord. You know, when Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 24, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. He meant that. But people are so ignorant of the Scriptures now, somebody can come along and say, The Bible says matrix. It never said that in the past. Why would a Hollywood movie be, be you, know, uh, you know, in the Bible now? Oh, and people, it's like, where do you think the Matrix movie got the name Matrix from? Okay, it's an old word, all right? People are gullible. But um, you see there that uh, in the Old Testament, Isaiah prophesies of John the Baptist coming and proclaiming, you know, that the king is there and that therefore, consequently, Jesus Christ the Messiah is there. The kingdom is offered to the nation of Israel. And Jesus is their king. He's the Messiah. It was offered. But the nation of Israel rejected. Go next to Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zabulon and Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is preaching it too. First, you have John the Baptist coming out and saying, Hey, prepare your way of the Lord. Make his path straight. The Lord's here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you want the kingdom? Do you want the Messiah? He's here. Are you ready to accept him? And the Jews said, That guy? No. That can't be the Messiah. He's a homeless Jewish carpenter. You know, questionable birth, you know, and no education, how know if this man, letters having never learned, they said about Jesus Christ, you know, God manifest in the flesh, the source of all truth. He doesn't have any degrees. <laughs> Brilliant, you know, real smart there on their part. Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees and things, you know, and they're going, not this guy. No, 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 no. And the Lord's going, you know, John says it first, and the Lord says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm here. They rejected Then Matthew's chapter, chapters 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, you know, and over and over and over again, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven. And we're not going to go through all those different uh, references, but there's something very important that you need to get here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 34 and 35. It says here, But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. 
Hmm. Is Jerusalem the city of the great king right now? Nope. Can you find out about Jesus Christ or offer sacrifice up to Jesus Christ by going to Jerusalem today? No. No. But they will be able to after the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, understand just a simple basic thing of Scripture here, brethren. Right now we're in the church age. The just shall live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Right? Saved by grace, through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2, 8, and 9, you can read that. All right, that's how things are right now. But the Jews require a sign. And the Jews are saying, he was our Messiah? No, he, wasn't our you know, he didn't do this and he didn't do that. You know, he didn't fulfill all the prophecies of the Messiah, so he couldn't be our Messiah. You know, They get a real attitude and things like this. And he's not our Messiah. He couldn't be our Messiah. Um, well, you see here in the New Testament, ah, oh, we reject the New Testament. We'll take the Talmud instead. We, we, we reject that New Testament. It's all a book of lies. It's Je Jewish hate and replacement theology and stuff. The Catholics have used it, so it's used to kill us. So we hate the New Testament. We reject it. Well, what's it going to take for the Jews to accept the New Testament? Signs. Specifically at the hands of two men. The two most revered men in all of Judaism. Orthodox Judaism, the modern Judea, you know, it's just secular stuff. They don't care really what the Bible says, even in the Old Testament. But Orthodox Judaism, they, re they revere two men more than anybody else, Moses and Elijah. Moses, the giver of the law, Elijah, the prophets. Okay? So those two men are going to come back, and Revelation chapter 11 talks about it, and they're going to do signs and wonders, repeating, Moses is going to be repeating a lot of the things he did in front of Pharaoh, Egypt, to bring them out there in the book of Exodus, to bring the nation of Israel out of Egypt. Okay, The nation of Israel right now symbolically is in the world. They are very worldly. Egypt is a type of the world. See how it all works out? The Jews are again in bondage to Egypt, also known as the world. They're there, and Moses is going to come back and say, i got some things to show you. They're going to go, who are you? Moses. What? Prove it. Moses isn't going to sit down and say, okay, let's get your Torah scrolls out and we're going to this and we're going to that. And stuff. He's not going to be saying anything of the kind. He's going to say, okay, you want proof? All right, watch this. Let's turn some water into blood. Wham! Let's uh, have some plagues come. Let's smite the earth with all manner of plagues and things like that for three and a half years. It's going to be something else. But again, that's going on over there in Israel, and he's smiting the earth with plagues. Uh, why would that happen there and the body of Christ in the rest of the world be smitten with plagues when we haven't done anything to deserve it? Now, the body of Christ is gone before the time happens. You see? Just, it's right there. But the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, you know, the full title there of the book, it's about... The Jews being given a time there that they get to see the New Testament being confirmed with signs and wonders so that they say, by the end of the thing, seven years of that, you know, three and a half years of Moses and Elijah doing all kinds of stuff, proving things, you know, preaching. I'm sure that they're going to be, you know, preaching Jesus Christ to the Jewish people. And what are, they, what are the Jews going to say? You know, the most uh, radical rabbis out there are going to be like, this is Mo Moses and Elijah. Look what they're doing. They're going wow, you know, this is really incredible. And at the three and a half year mark, things get real bad and things fall to pieces and they're running for their lives. And by the end of it, they're going, I hope Jesus comes soon to save us. Pretty incredible. And then they're ready for that millennial kingdom with Jesus Christ as their Messiah ruling and reigning on the throne in Jerusalem. That's how the thing's going to work out. Go next to Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Now, if you're non-dispensational, in other words, if, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth and say, well, what was going on here in Matthew is not the same thing that's going on today. Jesus shows up and he's offering himself as the king of the Jews. He gets crucified. They say, behold, your king, the king of the Jews. See, he's there. They crucified their king. The Jews crucified their king. So that kingdom, that millennial kingdom, gets put off. And it was offered again after you know Jesus came, went back up to heaven in Acts chapter 1. It's being offered again. And they reject him again. So they have, you know, what's going to be happening to Israel in the time of Jacob's trouble, they fully deserve it. And it's going to be a very, very bad time for them. It's going to make the uh, Holocaust there in Nazi Germany look like you know, a walk in the park. It's going to be a bad time for them. But you see right here, if you say, well, the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation, the whole thing is for Christians. They were always preaching the same thing. Okay, then why is it that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles and goes out and he's preaching to the Gentiles, but yet Jesus tells his disciples right here, uh, go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And, when ye, and as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's no preaching of the kingdom of heaven in, Paul, in the Pauline epistles, from Romans to the book of Philemon. There's no kingdom of heaven being spoken of there. There's no physical kingdom. See, that's called non-dispensational, not rightly dividing the word of truth. When you say the whole Bible's for me, I can just, they're preaching the same thing the whole way through it. Lost people believe that. People that don't have the spirit of discernment the Holy Spirit there to discern the Scriptures and say, wait a second, this can't be the same thing as what's going on back in the book of Romans or in the book of Ephesians or Galatians or whatever else. It's not the same thing. They were going out there preaching the gospel, or the, uh, yeah, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. The king was there. Matthew chapter 11. Verses 11 and 12. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. What's it talking about there? It's talking about the physical kingdom. How many armies have gone in and fought over the city of Jerusalem? You got all the holy crusades and things between Catholicism and Islam, and they're fighting each other, killing them like crazy and things, and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And now there's not much physical fighting going on anymore. There's skirmishes between the Palestinians, you know, the um, descendants of Ishmael, basically, and uh, they're not, they don't have any right to the land. And the descendants of Jacob, they do have right to the land, and there's fighting all the time between the two. But uh, the real battle is going on behind the scenes. The real battle for Jerusalem goes on behind closed doors and it happens with pens and paper. And that's why your Bible says back in the book of Daniel chapter 9 that the Antichrist, when he shows up, he confirms the covenant. It does not say anywhere that he writes out a peace treaty between the Jews and the Muslims and Arabs and things. And I believe that for years and years and years, but it's like the Lord led me to just really study that thing and it's like looking at it and it's like, where does it say peace treaty between the Jews and the Muslims? Or the Jews and the Arabs or the Jews, you know, Isaac and Ishmael and things, they, the, the, their descendants get along and it, the Antichrist makes this peace treaty between the two. It's not there, brethren. It's not there. He confirms the covenant. It's already written up when the Antichrist shows up. And all he does is he makes the final deal and he says, okay, this is what we're going to do. And my contention is it's not between the Jews and the Muslims or the Arabs or whatever, the Palestinians. It's between the Jews and the Roman Catholics. That's what the agreement is. And I could say a whole lot more on that, but I've talked about that in other studies. But... Uh, but let's you know look at verse twelve here because this is this is a key scripture. Okay, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Now a lot of the people will say, well, the kingdom of heaven is a reference to where God is, heaven. Uh, okay, um, when does it? When did heaven ever suffer violence? And when did violent the violent take it by force? You're going to go up there and take it away from God? No, you say, well, no, but God took it from God took it from who? 
the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and God's the one doing the violence, who did he take it from? No, it can't be heaven. Okay, you say, well, the kingdom of heaven is, is like the kingdom of God that's spoken of in the book of Romans and, and Romans chapter 14. And uh, keep your hand there in Matthew chapter 11. I just want you to see this because this is important. I don't have this in my notes, but we'll go here to Romans chapter 11, or excuse me, Romans chapter 14. I think it's verse 17. Yep, verse, Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And these dumb, bunny, non-dispensational post-tribbers, they'll say, well, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are one and the same. Oh, really? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 11. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. How can you make that the same thing? It suffereth violence, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. They're the same? The violent take it by force? How do you take peace, joy, and righteousness by force? And see, they got to do all these gymnastics and all this spiritual... Well, you see, and they just twist and contort the Scriptures. They rest the Scriptures onto their own destruction. You see, lost people can't handle the sword of the Spirit. It cuts them to pieces. They go to handle it, and they're, and they're fumbling the thing, and they're you know, flipping it around and stuff, and it's just cutting their hands and oh, hits them in the face and gets them in the chest and, and they're just slicing themselves to ribbons with the Word of God. The Holy Spirit has to come down and put this book in your hands and say, I'm going to teach you this book. There you go. Let me teach it to you. And if you're lost, if you haven't come to Him in a broken, contrite spirit, in a repentant state, and come to Him as a sinner, you see, Give up your self-righteousness. If you haven't done that, and you say, well, I just believe. I don't got to give up all, you know, anything, and I don't have to change, you know, have a changed life after salvation. After salvation, you notice I said that? Because they'll say, oh, you're saying you have to change before salvation. Can't happen. After salvation. You see? And if you haven't done that, you're never going to get the Holy Spirit coming into your life, changing you so that you can understand this book. Never going to happen. No, when you read the scriptures and you compare scripture with scripture, Matthew chapter 11 verse 12 is talking about a physical kingdom on the earth that's going to be here for that millennial kingdom and Jesus Christ is going to be ruling and reigning in that kingdom from the city of Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 24. It's so important to get this stuff. I mean, you know, it's, it's so exciting too. That's a neat thing to think about. Like I said, you know, there's so many things I'd love to go places. I'd love to, I'd love to see Germany. You know, uh, my ancestors are from Bavaria, and things I'm finding out little bits here and there, a little bit more here and a little bit more there, and where my ancestors came from and things. And, you know, it's not, it's not some kind of special thing that now I'm superior to other people. I'm just curious. I'm, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting study. I want, I want to know how the Lord made me and and you know where, you know, my family goes back through and stuff like that. It's an interesting thing to me. And, uh, you know, I'd love to be able to go over there. But it's like it's all messed up with the Muslim integration thing and, and all the other liberal laws in Germany. And it's just disgusting, you know. And uh, I'm going to get to see it in the Millennial Kingdom. And then when I get there, it's not going to be all messed up with man-made laws. And I'm going to have a different body. So there's not going to be any jet lag when I get off the airplane and there's not going to be any walking around over there and I ate something wrong and I got a headache now or I feel sick in my stomach or whatever. Um, I'm going to be back here on this earth for 1,000 years. No vexation walking around and seeing an adult bookstore over there and a bar over there and Catholic church over there and a Muslim mosque over there and a, this over here and that over there. Nope. Done. Don't have to worry about pickpockets coming up and trying to take your wallet or something like that. Won't be any. The Lord has given you many precious promises as a Christian. And you know what? Sometimes all that you're going to have in this life is those promises, brethren. Sometimes you're going to go through your life and it's just going to be like, 
everything is just falling apart and you're just going like, Lord, what is going on? I don't know what's happening. And you start to almost have like anxiety attacks and you're going like, what is happening? I don't understand what's happening. What you need to focus on, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. The Bible talks about that. Think about the rapture coming. Think about how wonderful and joyous it's going to be to hear your name called and all your problems are solved. Boom. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Up you go. Whoop. You know, I should say absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's what happens when you die. Excuse me. You'll be absent from the corruptible body. Okay. This corrupt, corrupt, corruption shall put on incorruptible. The corruptible shall put on incorruptible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's all going to be over. Up there. We're up there in heaven. Judgment seat of Christ. We're there with the Lord for the time of Jacob's trouble. Come back down and we're here for a thousand years. Really something to think about. When times get really, really rough. Think on those things. Just wanted to add that in there because it's very important. I know, you know that it's. It, I don't want to go off on a big tangent here, but I need to say this: <laughs> there are days, brethren. It's just like I, I'm sure a lot of you are experiencing this. You wake up, you're thinking, oh, "I got this stuff to do today. It's going to be a good day," and all of a sudden, it's just like, boom! You get hit, and you just like next thing you know, you're feeling sick, you feel depressed, you feel just like, "What is wrong? Something's wrong. I can't, you know, whatever." It's going to be over. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Think about that. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 through 31. It says here, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Read about that back in Zechariah. You know, that they're going to mourn when they see the Son of Man. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Jesus comes back to the earth physically. Go to Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 34. I talked about this earlier, the judgment of the nations. Verse 31, Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, like He was promised, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the King say unto them on His right hand, Come ye blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he goes down through there and he judges them according to their works. No mention of faith. A lot of things change in the future. And it, by the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, it is definitely, they are seeing things. It is definitely walking by sight. There's no doubt anymore um, that Jesus Christ is God. None. Revelation 19. What happens right before Jesus Christ comes back down in Matthew 24? We'll go back and I'll, we'll read about what happens here. Revelation 19, verse 1. It says here, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. There's people in heaven before the second coming. So post-trib the whole system there, the post-trib system. You have the pre post-trib pre-wrath or something like this. All these little funny little systems. It's all work salvationists. You know, that they're uh, worried for the pre-tribbers because some of them might not make it. We're sealed until the day of redemption. How are we not going to make it? I mean, hey, if I'm going to go into the, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, I'm just going to go ahead and take the mark of the beast. I mean, why not? I'm sealed until the day of redemption. I can't lose my salvation. I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. So if I'm going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, what am I worried about? Take the mark. Do whatever you feel like doing. Hey, you know, it's a ridiculous system. No, the body of Christ leaves before the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's why the time, the people that are in the time of Jacob's trouble, they have no eternal security. 144,000 are sealed. That's true. But the rest, they're being beheaded, 
all kinds of bad stuff happening to them. Why? Because they didn't take salvation when it was easy to take it right now in the church age, right now in this time period. You know, whosoever will, let him come. Come on, you want to get saved? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Get saved today. It's easy. Drop your self-righteous pride. Come on, get saved. You're a sinner. Don't you need some help with those sins? Aren't you a little tired of those sins? Oh, I just kind of like to experience a little bit more. A little more fornication, a little more drunkenness, a little bit more drugs, a little bit more television viewing, a little bit more whatever, rock music and whatever else. Why don't you grow up? You know that that stuff doesn't make you happy. You know it wrecks you. Wrecking your health. Wrecking your mind. You need some help. Come to Jesus Christ as the sinner that you are. And he'll clean your life up. <laughs> but let's continue. Rome, or, uh, Revelation chapter 19 verse 2 through 10. We're going to read here about the marriage supper of the Lamb. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath the, avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. The great whore there is Revelation 17 and 18, the Roman Catholic Church. Proven in many, many studies. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Everything that we just read there, Verses 1 through 10 happens before the second coming. And there's a whole group up there, the marriage of the Lamb and things is happening before the second coming. How could you be a post-tribber? Who's this group in heaven getting married to the Lamb before he even comes back down to the earth? A bunch of works salvationists. Verse 11 through 13. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The last one to violently take it by force is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Going to come down and rip it right out of the hand of the Antichrist and the false prophet. I'll take that city, thank you. Let's read about it. Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Something. Verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So the bride of Christ is up there. And we get mounted on horseback and come back down as an army. Can't wait. Verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Not his church. Not, well, symbolically through the Pope. He, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Jesus Christ is going to be ruling and reigning for 1,000 years on this earth. If you don't believe it, I am convinced, unless you're just brand new saved and very much deceived, if you don't believe this, after seeing all these scriptures, you're lost. Not because you're not a Denlingerite, a follower of Brian Denlinger or something like this, you're not, I'm not your hero or something. That, that doesn't determine whether you're saved or lost. It's plain English. The Holy Spirit will lead you into this truth. You'll see it and say, it's right there. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. 
not the church, not the Pope in the person of Jesus Christ, the vicar of Christ down here on the earth and his little pervert priests out there and things. It's ridiculous. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Judges the nations. Verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Like they even stand a chance. Verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Um, where does that happen? On the earth. Jesus Christ comes back and comes down to the earth and all he does is speaks and his word destroys the biggest military power that man could muster do you realize what you hold in your hands you say well yeah it's the body no no really just think about this for a minute the creator of the universe gives you a book How precious is this book to you? Do you feel that you can just go through and just change it whenever you feel that you don't like a certain part the way it's not translated correctly? You don't have a very high opinion of the Lord if that's what you believe. You call a book God's Word when you don't believe that it's perfect. That's why I call myself a King James Bible-believing Christian. This book, this King James Bible has a heritage of Christians dying so that I could have this book and hold it in my hands. First century Christians didn't have this. They didn't have this, this amazing gift of God to be able to walk around in a, with a single volume, Old Testament, New Testament. They didn't have this. I can hold it today. I got lots of them. I got them all over the place here. I give them to people, you know, and I, I got all kinds of different King James Bibles. What a blessing. What an amazing gift of the Lord. And yet you have people who call themselves Christians and they'll attack this book. And you say, okay, the King James Bible is not God's Word. What is? And they can't offer a substitute for the King James Bible. The Bible is somehow in here a little bit in a few places where it's translated accurately. And it's here in the Nestle's text, which, you know, we have, I have two editions, actually three editions right here, 25th, 27th, 28th. It's in there and we're always subject to change and or maybe it's the majority text here, you know, Hodges and Farstad, or maybe it's the Texas Receptus over here, or it's this or it's that. It's kind of in there, and, and well, some manuscripts into How can you live like that? Or you can look at this King James Bible, and you can say, you know what? This Bible has been used for over 400 years now, and it's, this Bible has produced more fruit than any of this junk right here. And I do mean junk. The Greek is junk, Okay. Don't tell me it's an exact science. There's over 40 different Greek texts and multiple editions of each one of those. Okay, I should say many of those. Multiple editions. Don't tell me that this is exact over here. It's not. And this stuff over here didn't produce nearly, not even a tenth of the fruit of this King James Bible. It's kind of like there's an old bridge, you know. And this old bridge is just solid, rock solid. Thousands and millions of people over the centuries have gone back and forth over this bridge. And over here is some brand new bridge that they just put up and they said, we think it might work. It, it might need a few repairs, but I think it should be okay. Which bridge are you going to take? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord and we're going to read about Him in this King James Bible. Why? It's been proven. It's been tested for centuries. You get these new little... Uh, I'll get back to the study here in a minute. Just got to go on a little rant here. Um... You get these new little, you know, here's a good one. 
you know, the green Bible made from recycled paper, the new revised standard version. It's a green Bible. It's got things in the front from uh, people from the United Nations and things like this. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of where the one is. But, you know, this, this whole thing, it's printed on recycled paper and it, it's trendy. It's, uh, no, it's actually a new bridge. It's not been tested throughout time. You know, Eugene Peterson, writer of the message, says it's a great thing and all this other stuff. You know what this thing is? Garbage. This is the book. And you read through the New Revised Standard Version, you compare it to this King James Bible, you'll see where it changes vital doctrine over and over and over and over again. Disgusting. And one day God's Word, the words spoken by Jesus Christ, are going to destroy a, the greatest military power ever. Lord's not going to go down there with a sword and be whacking him and stuff like that. He's just going to open his mouth and speak. Power. There's power in the Word of God. Make sure that you have the real one. Okay? Revelation chapter 20. Now we saw Jesus comes down to the earth in Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. Let's read that. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So we see, again, the Lord's down here on the earth. earth. He doesn't go back up. Satan is bound, cast into the bottomless pit for the thousand years. Look at verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. How can they be beheaded for the word of God if it doesn't exist in the end times? You ever think about that? And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with the church a thousand years. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. And they lived and reigned with um, the Pope and his priests for a few thousand years. Because a thousand years doesn't necessarily have to mean one thousand years. <laughs> you know, it's a thousand years, but not a thousand years. You know, yeah, okay. Um, the elevator doesn't go to the top floor, you know. Cuckoo. Uh, no, it says uh, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Verse 5. Let's read down to the end here of the chapter. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and, that, and shall reign with him. With him. Did you get that? A thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and are encompassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out, out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So funny, because what do the lost people say? What's their favorite statement when you try to witness to them? Don't judge me. What are they talking about? They're talking about their works. I'm a good person. Will usually be the next thing that follows up, don't judge me. I'm a good person. You know, they believe that they're going to be judged by their works. And they're right. They're absolutely right. I personally, I don't want to be judged according to my works. 
I've done enough things in five seconds to land me in hell for all of eternity. That's why I took the way out, Jesus Christ. He's the door that leads to salvation. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Yeah. So what is the conclusion of the matter? What's the one last thing that we have to talk about? Well, if you're a Christian right now, there's a, I mentioned this earlier, the thing about suffering for Jesus Christ. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. You see, yes, we're saved by grace. Yes, we're not saved by works. Uh, there are no works that will save you. Continuing works do not keep you saved. Uh, when you get saved, the Lord saves you. He gives you eternal life right then. Right? That's a very important thing to understand. That's eternal security comes in there. And uh, people that go all over the place to try and say that, well, you can lose your salvation, it's because they are working their way to heaven 100% of the time. I've always seen that. Uh, well, we can prove over here and we can prove over here that if you do these certain sins and if you, if you, you know, do this and do that, then, then you'll lose your salvation and things like this. Um, they're working their way to heaven. But if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and say, there's nothing here, okay? I put my faith in Jesus Christ, right? You do that, well, what part do works have then? Well, works are there to earn rewards, Okay, first of all, prove that you're legitimately saved, right? There will be a change, you know. I mean, it's, it's rock, you know, real rocket science there. You get saved by the God of heaven and His Holy Spirit moves into your life and people debate whether or not there should be a change there, you know. Like, <laughs> I think that there's going to be a little bit of a change when the God of the universe puts His Spirit into you, you know. I think a few things might change, you know. But the work's there. Works meet for repentance, you know, to prove that you've truly come to the Lord in that, you know, proper state, ending your self-righteousness. Secondly, your works are there to earn rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Thirdly, the works are there to um, earn you a place in the Millennial Kingdom. Okay, and I do believe that all Christians will be there in the Millennial Kingdom in some way, shape, or form. Um, but your the level of, of service that you get to do for the Lord ruling and reigning with Christ, in other words, that level of service will be dependent upon what you've done in this life for the Lord. And when you are working for the Lord, something happens. It's called suffering. All right? Let's look here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, begin there. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. When you die to yourself, your self-righteousness dies, you die and say, I'm not going to earn my way into heaven. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. He gives you new life. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. When you suffer as a Christian, that will earn you your suffering because you're working for the Lord. You see, that's going to earn you millennial inheritance. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And the, you know, no eternal security works salvationist jump up and down and say, see, he'll deny you if you deny him. Uh, keep reading. It's talking about inheritance. If you deny him, if you're ashamed of the Lord, you don't live for the Lord, he's going to deny you inheritance. How do you know? Verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Once you get saved, you are in Christ Jesus, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. He can't deny you at that point. All right, verse 14, of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. That's what I'm doing right now. I am charging you right there before the Lord. Put them, I'm putting you in remembrance of these things and charging you before the Lord. Don't strive about words to no profit. You say, what are you talking about? Well, now the reading here is an unfortunate reading. You see, the Greek word is Pilu costs or something. Just making up one, you know, and uh, it should be better translated. Instead of um, strive, it should be um, furiously fight or something. <laughs> it's 
subverts the hearers? How does it subvert you when you hear some stupid preacher standing up there and he says, now, I prefer the Nestles, what is this one? Here's the 28th. Got to get the most recent one, you know. I prefer the Nestles 28th. And let me just show you a little nugget here from the Greek, you know, and things like this. And um, actually, the papyrus fragment number, blah, 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 blah. You know what it's doing? It's subverting the hearer. Why? Because everybody thinks that they need to know this. You can't, you can't understand the Bible, you see. You can't have a real good relationship with the Lord and really be able to understand everything that the Lord has for you with just this. You need to have that. And you need to have that priest, and, <clears throat> I mean, uh, excuse me, preacher above you to uh, expound the Greek Scriptures to you because you're just ignorant laity. I mean, you know, look at this. Look at this. I mean, really. What a blessing. They had all the, you know, critical apparatus down there and everything else. All these different numbers and things. Isn't I mean, What a blessing. I mean, I, I was having a bad day the other day, you know, and, and, uh, and I just opened up my Nestle's text here and I just started reading. It just like, wow. It was just such a wonderful thing, <laughs> you know. Out on the street the other day, and this guy has come up to me, and he said, you know, he gets to talking, and I started witnessing to him, and I said, let me just show you the precious Word of God that will save your soul. Let me just show you that. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, right there, look at that. That line right there, isn't that, isn't that something, you know? <laughs> stupid. Absolutely stupid. Um you can have the book right here. And it's so funny, too, because these people that defend this junk over here, they'll complain about the archaic words in the King James Bible. They, they, they strain out a gnat, you see. They say, the, the King James Bible says per adventure. That's just, it's archaic. You can't understand it. Oh, it's, just so, it's so difficult. What should I read? The Greek. <laughs> you know? Okay, you know. Yeah, that, that's, that's easier to understand than this, you know, King James Bible. And, you know, the King James Bible is a spiritual book. And, uh, you know, I'm probably going to do a video on this. If, I don't even know. I might have a video on it already. I have no idea. Kind of lose track after a while, after, you know, um, nine years on YouTube and uh, ten years in the ministry. Uh, you start losing track, you know, after so many videos. But uh, I want to talk sometime about the thing of how do you understand the Word of God. What's the keys to understanding the Scriptures? Because, you know, you first get saved and you're, especially if you're a modern Christian, using the new versions, the NIV, the New American Standard, whatever, the King James might seem a little bit strange to you. But that's not because it's archaic. It's because it's a spiritual book. And as the Lord starts to reveal things to you and you get that relationship with the Lord worked out, you know, genuinely saved and you start to get, you know, good fellowship with the Kingdom of God, you know, the spiritual Kingdom there, um, you're going to start understanding this book, and it's going to be to the point, it'll get to the point where literally you will understand this book in amazing ways. You'll read a verse 50 times, and the 50th time you'll see something that's totally brand new you never saw in the verse before, and it relates to exactly what you're going through at that exact moment of your life. It's incredible. And you'll get to a point where you're reading this book and just being so blessed by this book, and you pick up a new version, it's just like, I don't understand a word of this thing. It doesn't even make sense. It's a spiritual book, okay? But let's continue here. Don't strive about words. And, and simple, another little simple uh, standard here that you need to come up with. If you see a preacher that knows about the Bible version issue and they still persist in using new versions, I'm pointing down here because that's where I keep all my new versions. They still persist in using their new version. Um, don't watch them for one second. Don't even watch them. The Holy Spirit is not guiding them to use one of the new versions. And again, if you don't know about this issue, this Bible version issue, the new versions that have come out since 1881, King James Bible was translated from 1604 to 1611. There were a few little minor changes there over the years. Some of the spelling was changed. The, the font was changed from a Roman font, or excuse me, Gothic font to a Roman font. The style of the letters and stuff like that, in other words. Um, and there was a few things, that, and the Bible that we have today is a 1769. By 1769, it was all the little things that had to change, and the English language was changing too, I might add. English was still a fairly new language in 1611, and 
these revisions were done. And from 1769 till today, this very day, this King James Bible has been the greatest Bible of all time. No question about that. And, you know, but the new versions from 1881 up until the present, the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, the New King James is, is blending of some King James readings and new version readings. They'll use the Nestle's text and the majority Greek text right here. But... Um, it goes back to two different streams of manuscripts. Again, I'm saying this, you know, my more experienced uh, viewers are probably going, yeah, we've heard this before. Yeah, but for the new ones, this set of Greek texts right here, the Nestles, 25th, 27th, 28th, this is an Egyptian, um, primarily Egyptian, uh, uh, Alexandrian line of manuscripts. And it, I mean, I realize that there's some you know, things back and forth on that. You know, it's not all just Alexandrian. I mean, I understand. But this is the vast minority, less than 1% of extant Greek manuscripts. In other words, if they find a Greek manuscript, less than 1% of the time it'll line up with this text here. And the Roman Catholic Church has used the Nestle's text for, you know, a long time. And, um, or variants thereof, you know. And um, then you have the majority text here, the Hodges and Farstad, which blends... These, I should, well, let me say that this one over here is the uh, Greek text from Antioch. It's a Syrian Greek text. It's used by the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, this is called the received text or the textus receptus. Okay. This one has been used. Um, this has never been used by the Roman Catholic Church. They refuse to use the textus receptus, the received text. And this is primarily what the King James Bible is based on. Okay. Primarily. Uh, Again, it's a big detailed issue. And uh, you say, well, but Brother Brian, and, and well, I'm getting ahead of myself again. I have a tendency to do that. This majority text here is a blending of Receptus and Nestles. Okay. Now that I've said that, you say, well, Brother Brian, how do we know then which one is right? How do we know that the King James is right if it's not perfectly translated from the Textus Receptus and things like this? Um, well, you know because of the fruit that it bears. And the King James Bible has borne the very, very best fruit. And, uh, you know, when you study it out, it's, again, you can't say, well, the Textus Receptus is the perfect scriptures and there's, you know, just whatever. You can't say that. Okay, there have been different corruptions and different things and stuff down through the centuries. The King James translators, what made this Bible different is they not only used the Textus Receptus and ignored the Alexandrian Roman Catholic text, but they also used other ancient translations, many times that were older than even Greek manuscripts. Uh, the early Christians had and things like that. Some of the Romance translations of the uh, Waldensian people, the Italians in northern Italy that did not follow Rome. Um, a lot of the other foreign language translations. And uh, ironically, the King James translators also had access. You can just barely see it up here. The... Um, Reims New Testament put out by the Jesuit order in uh, before actually 1582 is when it came out and then the whole Bible in 1610 one year before the King James translation was done and the King James translators actually had access to that so these guys down here will say well the, we have new evidence here with this Alexandrian text the Nestle's text that wasn't available in 1611 it's not true it was available in a different form up here and the King James translators had access to it, and they compared Scripture with Scripture. Uh, they truly uh, were experts at the translation process. But let's finish up here. One more verse to read here. Uh, key Scripture, one of the most important for Christians. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What happens when you don't rightly divide this book is you will make a mess of scripture you will be god will actually be ashamed of you uh, and you will be ashamed a lot of times because you're going to make yourself out to be a total complete fool you're going to make the scriptures contradict you're resting the scriptures unto your own destruction so that's going to be it for this study um there's no question if you're saved if if uh, you have the holy spirit of god you will be pre-millennial in your belief system. 
again, I mean, this isn't rocket science, brethren. Either Jesus Christ is the only one that can physically reign on the earth and bring in a thousand years of peace, or there is no millennial kingdom, it's the church reigning, or the church brings in the thousand years of peace. Which one is it? Man is a failure, and Jesus Christ needs to rule and reign physically on the earth. Or man is not so bad after all, and man is already ruling and reigning, or man will in the future. So that's going to be it for this study. And uh, I have another couple little videos I'm going to be doing here. But uh, we'll close with a word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the precious gift of your word and how we would just be so in the dark if we did not have a perfect standard. And uh, I thank you, Lord, for the King James Bible and, and for the tremendous uh, heritage that it has and uh, the, just the millions of Christians that have landed safely in heaven, on the shores of heaven, I, you could say it that way, that uh, have gotten there and uh, with full assurance of salvation and um, just amazing lives that they've lived as a result of following your word and spreading your word. And I pray, Lord, that all of us would stand by your word and not let any of these wicked ministers of Satan try to come in and subvert us by striving about words to no profit. And uh, that we would all look forward to the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage of the Lamb, and the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then the millennial kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for your precious promises and help us to stand by this book no matter what happens, no matter what is said about us. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, another one of the studies done in premillennialism. I hope that you are very much convinced that that is the right belief system. And uh, that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. We will see you in the next video. And please do keep us in your prayers. We greatly appreciate that. Thank you.